and you can you can certainly be aware as I think you get a message that that from here on it'll be recorded and uh, you can know that if you have comments or questions that you will raise your hand and ask about. Again, I'm Kevin Ryan, State Engineer and Director of the, Director of the Division of Water Resources, and we are engaged in a rulemaking process in the Div Division 7 uh, river basin, water basin, what we call the division at our office, and the numerous tributaries that flow out of Colorado in Division 7. I want to introduce some other people that I believe are on the meeting or will join us shortly. And uh, certainly Jason Ullman, the Deputy State Engineer who works in the Denver office is with us tonight. He's going to present some information and he'll give himself a better introduction in just a few minutes. And then Rob Genualdi, the division engineer that works out of the Durango office and oversees all the operations from the Division of Water Resources in Division 7 is here. He can do a better uh, introduction for himself in a few minutes as well. But then I want to mention John Simpson, the assistant division engineer from Durango. And with us now, or maybe joining us shortly, are a few of our water commissioners in the division office. And these are the people that I think those of you that operate in Division 7 will know, will know the names, people you know and trust. And that's Marty Robbins. I don't think he's been quite able to join yet, uh, is with us. Justin Catalano, Jeff Titus, Tom Fiddler, Warren Gabbert, and Craig Dollar. And Rob, when, when you come up, if I'm miss someone or someone joined that I didn't expect, um, please raise that. But I also want to introduce that um, Sherry Titus from our Division 7 office is on, and we're going to give you some contact information for her shortly. She's part of the expert help we get in putting this together and um, providing this, um, this contact and communication with you as we go through this process. So Sherry, thank you for being available. I also want to note that um, Stacy Coleman from the Department of Natural Resources is on the call. Stacy is our tribal liaison and is very active. She's rel relatively new to the Department of Natural Resources, but she's very active. Um, you'll be hearing more from her down in Division 7, I'm sure, over time. Those are my introductions, and I am going to then share my screen and begin talking about this, unless there are any initial questions you'd like to um, present us with. Um, that's for anybody, anybody that's listening in. Uh, John Simpson, I see you on my screen. Can you give me the thumbs up that you're seeing the full screen of my slides? Okay, thank you. Here's a quick introduction for what we're doing tonight and what we've been doing in Division 7. And it really has to do with the importance of water rights in Colorado. And I'm going to just talk about some fundamental things when it comes to water rights in Colorado, because those of you that own water rights and operate water rights, you realize that that's a very valuable possession. It's, it's a property right in Colorado. And it doesn't happen without any direction from our history as a state. Our Colorado constitution identifies water as a public resource. It's not owned by the state. It's not for sale by the state. It's a public resource subject to appropriation by the residents of the state subject to one critical component and one critical idea, and that is the application of that water to a beneficial use. So again, those of you that have a water right in Colorado, that is your property right, and it's a valuable right, and with it comes a certain level of responsibility. And primarily that responsibility is that as your decree, as your water right describes, you have to put it to that decreed beneficial use without waste and subject to the other characteristics of that water right. For example, the amount 
and the place it can be applied. And as I said before, for particular beneficial use. That's that responsibility. And part of that responsibility is fulfilled then by, as I said, diverting only what you're allowed. And part of that is achieved by measuring it. We've had uh, statutes that address that, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But that's the reason that we're so interested in measurement in Colorado and why measurement rules are so critical. And I'm going to go into more detail on that now and then shift the discussion over to Jason and then over to Rob Genualdi. And if I don't have any questions, I, Jason, I see you. Uh, you don't have anything to interject before I get started. Is that right? <clears throat> well, I was just going to say that you're you're sharing the notes view so we can see your notes and the, first, the slide you're on and the next slide. So I don't know if you wanted to share the screen uh, as the full slideshow. Let me just let me just fix that because I thought I had. Um, Corrected that. Um, thank you, Jason. Let's try one more time. Um, Is there that we better, go. Jason? Okay. Yeah, that's that's the that looks like the whole slide. So yeah, that was my failure. Right Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone again for bearing with me. And let's launch into this because it's a lot of important information, but we can get through most of it fairly quickly. But it really starts with this question of why do we need measurement? And again, we're measuring the amount of water that's diverted according to the water right. And I break it into three areas, and one of them is administration during a call. And Jason will talk about this more, but we understand the lexicon generally that that is a call means there's not enough water in the river to satisfy all the water rights. So there's a certain point in the list of priorities that is not going to be getting its water because upstream junior water rights are taking the water. And so we want to be able to ensure that we're measuring all these water rights properly just to make sure that we're adhering to the prior appropriation system and everybody is getting what they're entitled to, but not more. So that's one reason. The other reason is administration during compact compliance administration. That's an interesting point because it, it has to do with compacts, but it's pretty similar to the first point. And that is that if there comes a time in the Colorado River Basin, or let's even say in the La Plata, when the compact requires that there's curtailment that takes place, then we need to know how much people are taking and know who to curtail and by how much. I really need to state as a placeholder that we don't see that in the immediate future, there's gonna be a compact compliance obligation that requires curtailment in Colorado, but I can't foresee, you know, many years into the future and tell you for sure that's not the case. And that leads to the third point, and that is data and the importance of data. Data is critical in two ways. One, to protect your individual water right, to ensure you have recorded the data that prevents you from ever being subject to abandonment, but also then to protect Colorado water users again during that compact compliance obligation. I can tell you that based on my knowledge that if Colorado in the future were to be subject to compact compliance administration, then one of the things that the upper basin states in the Colorado River would look at is how much water Colorado had used in the recent 10 years. And if that's going to impact our Colorado water users, we want that record of data to be very accurate and representative of what actually happened. We don't want estimates. We don't want somebody overestimating what we used. So that's why we really like to pay attention to measurement 
And then that leads to the importance of measurement uh, measurement rules. Now, the, the measurement authority that we have is statutory. This is a law, as I said in the introduction, that's been in the statutes for over 100 years. And it says, I've, I've got it in um, very short form here, that the owners shall erect where necessary a proper head gate and proper measuring flutes or weirs or devices. And of course, that's where necessary, if it's necessary for administration, as I described before. Now that we understand why we need measurement, why do we need measurement rules? As I say there, the statutory authority is already clear. The law allows Rob Genuality to order measuring devices on, on a diversion from the river or on a well. But the value of doing this through rulemaking is important to both the Division of Water Resources and the water user. It allows us to address details related to measurement ahead of time. So what does that really mean, addressing details ahead of time? It means that you won't get random orders or what would appear to be random orders from Rob in the mail someday without really understanding how to comply or what the reason is. Instead, we would have a, a level of consistency and transparency for all the water users and we could recognize up front what types of diversions there are and how their needs might differ as far as measuring devices. We could plan for options and alternatives. And, and that allows the water user to see the technical and administrative guidance to help them do the best they can to comply with the need for measurement. And then stakeholder involvement. What we're doing tonight, what we did in previous four meetings in the basin in person, that is showing you what we're doing and getting your input, getting your concerns. It helps us to improve the rules. It helps us to understand what maybe we didn't plan for, something we didn't see. And then of course, efficient implementation because everybody knows the rules, everybody knows the deadlines, everybody knows what's expected. So we get the most efficient implementation out of that process. To give the, a, a little more detail, but maybe just reiterating, measurement rules would give guidance that gives a clear path for both you as water users and for Rob Genualdi and his staff regarding the implementation of that statutory authority. And it answers questions, what is an adequate head gate and when, when is an adequate, or sorry, when is a head gate necessary? What is an adequate measuring device and when is that necessary? And then something we always forget about, but if we're going to all this trouble to measure diversions, we need to record that data. It's important data for the owner of the water right, and it's important data to protect Colorado's interests. And Jason, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point to talk a little bit more about water rights and administration. Sure, thanks, Kevin. Um, so as Kevin said, uh, I my name is Jason Ullman. I'm one of uh, deputy state engineers that work for Kevin. Uh, my programs that I oversee include the water information team, our hydrography team, which is a team that measures streams and um, takes care of gauges in the state of Colorado and our dam safety group. Um, and then I also deal with technical issues on the Colorado River. Um, what is my background? So I actually was the assistant division engineer in division four uh, for about 12 years uh, before mm -hmm. taking this job. And I actually still live in Montrose right now. So I'm not too far away from all of you, although I am right now, cause I'm actually in the Denver office, but um, so I have some experience with water administration in division four. And what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight is uh, why is measurement important for water administration? And we have a few examples to go through. So, you know, administration is essentially the act that our staff go through um, every day to determine what priorities are in priority on the stream, which priorities can take water on the stream. 
So the things that they need to know to make those decisions, their administrative decisions are you know, listed here. You need to know what the available flow is in the stream. You need to have a list of water rights by priority. So our commissioners typically have a table of water rights that's sorted by priority that have a cumulative amount that's in the, that needs to be in the river for these rights to be able to take water so that they can decide a starting point when the call comes on. Um, the person placing the call needs to have a senior water right that's not getting their amount in order for us to administer a call. So those are the basics. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, a lot of basins in Colorado um, are on call pretty much all year round. So that's the divisions one, two, and three. We have the South Platte, the Arkansas, and the Rio Grande that have uh, either water rights calls from senior water rights typically all year round or water or compact call that's in place during most of the year. The basins in the western side of Colorado um, are kind of are in transition to some extent. Um, some of them haven't had a consistent call in Division 7. Some of them may have not had any call in the past. But what we've noticed, and this is you know something I've noticed in Division 4, is that those demands and the frequency of calls on streams has increased in the last 20 years during this this drought. Um, so we have higher demands, we have higher temperatures, uh, more consumptive use, uh, pressures from downstream because of the low levels in reservoirs. And so many basins uh, in the state, including in Division 7, are transitioning from a systems that aren't on call at all and we aren't curtailing water rights to ones where we may be curtailing them more frequently or have to curtail them for the first time. Next slide. So I already, I guess, talked a little bit about this, but what are the three, what are the components that the division engineer needs to administer a water right? So the division engineer is the primary person responsible through their staff to administer water rights uh, in the state. So a decree for beneficial use, including the amounts, dates, and a location for the beneficial use and a location for the diversion. A head gate or a control structure that we can actually use to control the amount going into the structure. And then a measuring device that we can act, use to determine how much water is being taken. And then also, you know, we need to know or, or be able to confirm that the water user is actually making beneficial use of the water. Next slide. So head gates was one of those primary things that I listed just in the last slide. And head gates are part of the measurement rules. So there is some, some more specifics to our statutory authority to require a head gate in the draft of the rules that a lot of you have probably looked at. And why do we need a functional head gate? Well, uh, basically, if the call comes on the river and the water commissioner has made a determination that they need to control or change the amount of water entering a diversion because they're either fully or partially out of priority, they need to be able to adjust and control the amount of water entering that diversion. And so without a functioning head gate, if, if there's nothing there to control, if it's just need, if you have to use a shovel or a backhoe, that's not acceptable, you know, because we can't be rely on that method to control what's going into a ditch. It needs to be relatively close to the measuring device. And this is in the measuring draft measuring rules. And the reason for that is because as the commissioners on the phone to, you know, today will tell you, it's difficult if that measuring device is a mile downstream, a half mile downstream from the head gate, because they adjust the head gate and then they go to the measuring device to see if they've put the water that they, the amount of water that they thought they needed to for that call into that structure. If it's not quite right, they've got to go back to the head gate, adjust it, and then run back to the measuring device. You might imagine that takes a long time if, uh, if it's a long ways away. Some of our, you know, staff have gotten very good at estimating. But the, yeah, go on. <laughs> Next slide. So we have a 
tongue in cheek here picture of whether this is a good or bad head gate. And in the in-person meetings, I've asked people to say, you know, to answer the question. And obviously this head gate doesn't do a good job of collecting or controlling the flow. The water's going around it. Um, this was washed out by a flood. And then this one, you know, is this a good or a bad head gate? Um, and this one we would qualify as a good head gate. Uh, you see the commissioner there looking at the staff gauge on the side of the flume. The flume is within sight of the head gate, and so they don't have to go very far to make those adjustments. And you know, the flume looks like it's operating correctly. It's kind of hard to tell how submerged it is there, but we would consider that a good head gate. So here's those examples that... Um, I mentioned earlier on administration and why measurement is so important for us to do our job. So the first example is the stream system where you have a river and a tributary with three water rights on it. So the first water right on the river is ditch A. Uh, it has a water right uh, for 50 CFS from 1880. I guess I shouldn't say first because that's a misnomer. Uh, that's the first one I mentioned, but the most senior water right is ditch B, 200 CFS for eight, with a date of 1875. And then the most junior water right on the system is on the tributary, which is ditch C, with a 100 CFS water right for, with a date of 1895. So in this situation, we're going to say there's no measuring. None of those three structures have a measuring device. And so... The situation is Ditch B calls the commissioner, the owner, and says that they're 120 CFS short. And the question is, what does the commissioner do in this case? So um, how do you know, or how do they know that B is short and by how much? Now they can probably tell if they go out and look and see that it's half short or it's you know significantly short but they won't be able to tell exactly by how much. Um, so they go to ditch A, what if ditch A is taking more than 50 CFS, but there's no measuring device, so we can't confirm that. Um, the question, is it right to curtail C completely? In, in the per, in-person meetings we've done, I've asked the commissioners to answer, but I think you know they would answer that you wouldn't, honor this call because the calling water right doesn't have a measuring device to know how much we need to go take from other folks. If um, So that's the first situation. The next situation is, uh, next slide. Sorry, there's always a little lag time here. Oh, yeah, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> So the next situation is some measurement. So if you look at the, this new situation, ditch B installed a measuring device. So maybe you will just suppose that the first situation happened and they, they were unhappy because they couldn't uh, make use of their water right or call for their water right. So they placed a measuring device at their structure. Now ditch B, but the other two still do not have measuring. So in this case, Ditch B calls the commissioner and claims to be 120 CFS short. The commissioner goes out and can confirm that yes, they are only getting 80 CFS of their 200. And so now what does the commissioner do? Well, if he knows it's 120 CFS short, he can certainly curtail C fully because he knows they're the most junior. That's 100 CFS, but still doesn't know how much A is taking and doesn't know how much he needs to curtail tail A back to um, to bring that water down or what A would be entitled to take. So the final situation is the holy grail where everything's measured. And so now ditch A, ditch C, and ditch B all have measuring devices. So when ditch B owner calls the commissioner and says they're 20, 120 CFS short, not only can they confirm that, but they can confirm that we're going to pretend the situation that Ditch C and Ditch A are taking just their decreed amounts. And so Ditch C was taking 100, he curtails fully Ditch C, and then Ditch A is taking 50, and so he needs to curtail them back to 30 CFS to bring that 120 CFS 
down the river, he or she. So in this case, um, they can be confident, the commissioner can be confident that they made the right decision. Everybody that's entitled to take water under their water rights is getting their water based upon the supply. This is a simple situation. We didn't figure in transit losses. The assumption is they're all real close to each other. So those weren't uh, having an impact. Um, but when you have large systems with many water rights on them, it becomes even more difficult. And I guess this, this example kind of shows why it might be really difficult on those systems to do their, to, to administer the stream without measurement. Are there any questions about those examples from anybody? Okay, hearing none. So um, the measuring rules has some definitions of some different terms, and I feel it's important to describe a few of them here before we talk about these different things. And so the overarching um, term for measurement is measurement methods. So the measurement methods is defined as including measuring devices and alternative measurement methods. So a measuring device is a physical piece of infrastructure that you put in the ditch that controls the relationship between the level in the, in the structure and the flow rate. So you have a defined rating table, we would call it, that allows you to know what amount is flowing through that structure based upon the level. And alternative measurement methods are more indirect ways of measuring flow. So we're gonna cover both of those things, but first we're gonna talk a little bit about devices, which people are probably pretty familiar with, but devices include flumes, and those are probably the most common thing, a way we measure flow in open channel systems. And the most common by far of those is the partial flume um, developed in Colorado at CSU by Ralph Partial. And uh, it's actually the most common structure around the West. There's some others like a ramp flume that have become more common because you can design those in a bureau program called wind flume and customize it for your ditch and it requires less head loss to get an accurate measure. Uh, cutthroat flumes, and then there's a couple others there that are not as common. But we've got some pictures here. You want to uh, right. arrow forward? What? Still can't. There we, there go. we go. And so this is a, a partial flume. It looks to me like it's a good partial flume. It's got a fairly still pool above it. You can see that there's a drop through the flume which is where that water is going through a control. It's going from what we would call supercritical to subcritical flow, which keeps that relationship between the depth in the flume and the flow constant. And the commissioner there is reading the staff gauge, which Rob's gonna talk about a little bit later. Next. So uh, this is a ramp flume and I have a few pictures of them because they can look different. So this is in a trapezoidal ditch uh, it's a poured concrete ramp flume um, designed specifically for that situation. It can be vertical sides with a vertical back end. And then I think there's one more. And then sometimes we have some fabricators that are you know, fabricating these out of steel now and making them to the specific specifications that they're designed to. The only downside to those is that you have a unique uh, rating table, whereas for partial flumes, you have a, a book of rating tables that covers all the different sizes. So the next type of device, uh, second most common would, would be weirs. And most of the ones that are on this sheet here are sharp crested weirs. And so you see that there's a bunch of different shapes. So you can have rectangular, uh, cipolletti, which is kind of a trapezoidal shape, and then a triangular or, or V-notch weir, which is typically used to measure low flows because it can measure very low flows to, to higher ones. Here's a photo of a, of a typical sharp crested V-notch weir with the staff gauge on the right. And I think that's the only one I have pictures of. Yeah, I think so for the weirs. So next slide, I think. So now uh, this is the classroom 
you know, test here, which is a, it's important to have a device, but just having a device doesn't mean that it's measuring properly. So it has to be installed properly. So what is a proper installation? Well, these two pictures are obviously of, of installations that are not quite measuring all the flow on the left. And on the right, it's not measuring the flow either because it's beached. So then here's the test. So uh, which one of these, right or left, is a correct installation and measuring properly? And so, mm. yeah, go ahead. Somebody chime in with an answer. Okay, so I'll say that uh, the one on the right looks to be pretty a pretty good installation. The one on the left appears to not be measuring the full flow. It's actually overtopping the flume. And then the same thing here, which one works? So this one's an interesting one because it demonstrates submergence. So the one on the left, you'll see it has that nice control section where it's dropping through the, the water levels, dropping through the flume. The one on the right looks pretty still. It's pretty calm. That flume is completely submerged. And there's many reasons that the flume, you know, flumes get submerged. It could be uh, excessive growth of vegetation down below it, could be sedimentation down below it, could be that it's set too low. Um, but this is where, you know, evaluating the conditions at all times is necessary because a flume that works properly at the beginning of the season may not work properly at the end when the growth happens. So it's got to be kept clean. So that covers devices and uh, alternative measurement methods, like I said, is a measure of is a way to measure flow more indirectly. So typically an alternative method or a rated section is what we would use to measure stream flow. So you have a, and you can tab forward, I think there's a picture here. So you'd have a section of stream and the enough measurements are made at that section of stream to come up with a rating table so that you know the relationship of depth to flow so that when you measure the depth, you can tell how much water is at this stream section in this case. So you'll see there that uh, we have somebody measuring with a current meter, and these are important because there's a couple different um, measuring device systems mentioned when we talk about verifying a measuring device's accuracy. To do that, you have to go out and actually measure it, unless it's properly installed, which we'll talk about later. So the, uh, the other one is, no, that's good. So this is a rated section in a canal. Um, this has been a rated section. This is on the East Canal in the Olathe area. Um, and because the canal is so flat, this has been used, been measured with a rated section for many years. So it has a well-developed rating table. You'll see on the far left there of the ditch, you can kind of see an orange outrigger. That is the uh, acoustic Doppler profile boat that uh, the, the hydrographer is pulling across the stream multiple times to measure the flow rate, just to confirm that our rating table is still correct. So that's another one of the methods that we can use to go out and verify the accuracy of devices. And then the float test is the second one there on the typical alternative measuring methods. That is where you would throw something that floats in the, in the channel and uh, measure how long it takes it to go a known distance and get and calculate the velocity. If you know the area of the channel, you can now calculate the flow rate. And this method, because we've been asked this, um, could be used as a temporary method for or an emergency method if the measuring device is not functioning properly or a flood happened and washed it out or but it is not go, going to be in the in the rules specifically as a, or it's not in the draft rules specifically as a method for long-term measurement. But it's definitely a good way to get an estimate. And one of the reasons why devices are preferred is that these alternative methods, they require 
some assumptions, they require calculations, they require predictable field conditions. So they work better in consistent channels that don't change. Um, and then because of that, they require careful verification of the division engineer. And in the draft rules, you'll see that they require um, verification every four years, whereas a measuring device does not. So I think this is where I turn it over to Rob to talk about actually measuring these blooms. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, um, and Kevin. Uh, I'm Rob Genualdi, and I'm the division engineer here in uh, in Durango. And uh, and so uh, just to give you a feel for things, um, the state is divided into seven divisions. And that's under the Division of Water Resources. And so there's seven division engineers, and there's seven water courts. And uh, we all work uh, directly, well, not the water court, but the division engineers uh, work directly under Kevin. So he's, he's our boss. And, um, and mainly what happens uh, in the division offices, of course, is, is uh, administration on the ground. And, and, and that's your water commissioners. And, and uh, Kevin asked if I just uh, point out some of our staff there in, in the division office. And uh, many of you guys uh, know these folks. And and uh, know me as well, but uh, John Simpson's on the line and he's he's assistant division engineer. And he and I uh, do um, a bit like uh, air traffic control, making sure things happen at, at uh, one level. And then, you know, the, the water commissioners do the real work. They're the pilots. They're to make sure that things can happen uh, correctly in each each river base and uh, making sure that the priority system uh, uh, is is run correctly and that folks get their their water right, uh, get their water under their water right. Um, so, so I think we've got, I haven't looked at the full list, but I think we have Marty Robbins and, and Jason Catalano and, uh, and then Rusty Krangle might be on the line too. Uh, he's, the three of them are in the Cortez area. Um, Jeff Titus, um, and Tom Fiddler are uh, on the Animus and Florida respectively. Um, uh, Warren Gabbard over on the Pine, uh, Craig Dollar and, uh, Becky Williams are in the Pagosa Springs area. And so, uh, yeah, those are the folks that really, you know, make things happen on the ground and and uh, and and uh, and it tr to do the Truid Water Administration. Um, I'll also mention uh, who Kevin had mentioned also is uh, Sherry Titus. He, she's our program uh, assistant in in really uh, uh, is is one of our contacts in the Durango office. And also, I, I think her her uh, email address will be coming up shortly. And uh, and if you want to get on our uh, email notification list, you can email her and just request that so that you'll know if there's, uh, you know, if new drafts of this uh, process, the, the it, uh, you know, the measurement rules is, are prepared, they can, we can notify you that you can look at those and, and make comment to, the, to those and that kind of stuff. And, and if there's any more meetings, we can also notify you that way. So uh, Sherry Titus will be handling that and you can email her at her email address that'll be coming up. Um, I'll mention something else here before I get going on on the rest of this. And so in the in, in the Division 7 Water Court, um, I may have uh, been involved uh, with you or uh, just let you know that, you know, we handle water rights applications when when uh, folks are going to appropriate uh, a new new water for a new use. Also changes to water rights. If you got a water right you used to use for irrigation, now you uh, want to use it for some other purpose that has to go through a change case in the Water Court. So uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that happens at the at the division office level. Now, um, Emily Halverson will be coming up in just a few minutes and she'll be talking about how this process is gonna move through the, the water court. And it's just a little bit different process and it's handled differently. And I'll just say that, you know, in the water uh, rights application process, there's a, there's a lot of back and forth that can happen and, uh, and people can uh, oppose that kind of thing and, and, and the process is, can be iterative and, uh, and, and when it moves through. But let me, uh, let me move on to what um, this this particular slide is showing us, and that is um, on the right hand side. You'll see a staff plate, uh, and and what that is 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 a ruler, <laughs> and and this is uh, you know many of you have seen these before, and uh, and I, but we do run across every once in a while people aren't reading them quite right, so we just want to share a little bit with how this works. So so on that on that staff plate, uh, and this is typically measured in tenths of feet, so you can see at the very top there's a 1.0. 
uh, that's it's probably reading one foot. And then, uh, and then as you move down, you'll see the uh, nine tenths, the eight tenths of a, a foot on down. But this water level is uh, approximately uh, 0.474 uh, in, uh, feet uh, in depth. And this is probably water moving through a flume, similar to what Jason was showing you with a partial flume. And, and so to get what, how much is actually um, flowing through that, that flume, uh, you don't just look at the, the depth is one component, but you go to this rating table that he's talking about and you can find out what the discharge is or how much flow in cubic feet per second is moving past that, that point. And so uh, in this example, you can see where it says the flume size, it's, it's at two foot. And where that's measured is literally at the most constricted point in the flume, just measuring straight across horizontally uh, that it's two foot wide. And, uh, you know, there's many of them that are six inches, one foot, one and a half, two foot. This is just one example of a two foot. So when, when it's measuring 0.47 feet deep uh, in this flume, a two foot flume, you're actually getting a, a flow rate of 2.48. And that's uh, generally what uh, the flow rate is what uh, your water rate is based on. In most cases, you'll have a use and a priority. And and where you can take it off a river and what your source is, but a, a critical element to that water right is also the flow rate. Um, and so that's that's what we're demonstrating here is how you get to that in a measuring device. So like I said, a typical one might be a partial flume that Jason was speaking to. So, and, and so how might that be recorded? Um, so, uh, you know, we go out there, uh, meaning our water commissioners go out there regularly, they're out in the field, they wanna know what's going on out in the field so they can uh, distribute water under the priority system in accordance with priorities. And, but there's an advantage to folks also contributing to that effort. And that's that would be on occasion going out uh, to their own flume and looking at what that, uh, that flow rate is and jotting that down. And that can be as simple as in a, on a piece of paper and a notebook. And, and let's say you just went out there once a week or once every few days uh, or once a month uh, and you, you took, a, took a reading of that, wrote it down, and periodically you provided that to the water commissioner. You know, that might be at the end of the year or you might see that water commissioner a few times a year. Um, but we can't be out at, at structures every day in most situations. Now, I'll explain something a little further. The La Plata, as many of you know, is, a, is highly... Um, contentious because there's a there's a uh, compact on the La Plata River with New Mexico. And so measuring that has been uh, in great detail has been going on for uh, since 1922, basically, when that compact was signed. Um, and so our water commissioners uh, may even go to some of those measuring structures twice, two, three times a day in some cases, or at least certain ones. Um, in other basins, let's say on the on the animus, uh, where there's more water than there is water rights, uh, Jeff Titus might only get to some of those structures once every uh, once a month, uh, maybe once a year. So your contributions here uh, could be valuable for protecting your water right, uh, for protecting Colorado's water uh, in, in the bigger picture. So, anyways, um, so jotting it down is is very useful. Now on the on the right there. Um, is oh, let me yeah let me just go real quickly here. Um, no, is is, time, a, is a shelter? Oh, go ahead. I, I was say gonna say, take your time. That was a misfire for me. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So on the right there, uh, real quickly is a uh, a shelter that has measuring equipment in it. Uh, the wall uh, there's there's usually pipes between the 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 ditch or the river that communicate. In other words, the 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 level of the water on the in the river the ditch. Uh, is is uh, is is sent over uh, at, to the same level in the shelter, and there's a recording device in, in a float that that measures that and puts it into either a digital form or on a chart, and so that's what you see on a lot of the rivers. Uh, and the USGS has been doing that for years. You'll see that on the left as well for a smaller uh, structure, a flume. It, it's the same idea. There's there's some kind of recording device in that shelter, 
and then there's a pipe going into the ground and then there's pipe <laughs> going horizontally into the into the ditch and so it's a it's an automatic recorder it does it maybe punch maybe gives you a reading every 15 minutes maybe every hour maybe once a day depending on the situation lakes or something like that you might just need once a day a stream system you might need every 15 minutes so um i think kevin might tell you right about now that if you needed one of these these recording devices that record continuously like like i'm showing here you probably know it already because we'd already told you we need something like that. In most cases, we just need these periodic readings. And you can get with your water commissioner and see what kind of periodic means for you. Things change quickly. We might want it a little more often. If it don't change, they don't change very quickly, maybe a little less often. So, but we can work, we can work through that with you on an individual basis. Go ahead, Kevin. So, you know, here again, why is, why is this information uh, important? Uh, you know, the data is valuable and, and the value of that is based on, uh, of a water right is based on your beneficial use. You have a, you have a, a right to, let's say, take two cubic feet per second, uh, but uh, wonder if you've only taken one CFS over, you know, many, many years, then, then that's really the measure of your water right. Uh, if you ever went to a change case to the water court or something like that. Um, if, if you have readings that show that you've been taking water, you're protected against abandonment, which by statute we're required to do an abandonment evaluation every 10 years. Nobody wants to abandon a water right, not the court and certainly not us. We don't actually, uh, Division of Water Resources doesn't abandon a water right, only the court can make it or abandon a water right, but we're part of the process and have to provide information to the court. We're kind of the technical arm in that respect. And so anyways, um, it's good to get this information, not just for you guys, but for us as well. Um, you can optimize your, your operations, knowing how much is flowing at a certain time and how much you're applying to your fields or whatever the use is. So anyways, that's, uh, that's, that's, those are all important things. And then lastly, you know, um, uh, it, it, it helps the state protect the water for the overall good of all the residents of Colorado. Lastly, you know, transparency, it's, when we can provide these records at the end of the year, um, everyone knows what everyone else is doing and it's good. Trust has come from transparency. That's very important to us, uh, not just internally our, our staff, but amongst, amongst other water users. Okay. There we go. Yeah, and so there's several ways that we can report this uh, these uh, diversion records. The most, useful kind and easiest way is to get with your water commissioner uh, at some point uh, when they're out, you know, doing their periodic checks, ask them what would be in it, how often maybe they should do that kind of thing and literally just uh, write it down. And then when you see them toward the end of the year or you call to our office, or maybe we're gonna set up an email uh, uh, communication so you can just submit that to our office directly. There may be some other tools we pr uh, provide down the line that you can actually dump that data in, but we'll get there. Uh, most importantly, you get it first and foremost, probably to your water commissioner. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah. And so talking to that water commissioner is the best way to to find out what's what would be the most useful for you and for us in the long term. Uh, we call that user supplied data. Uh, not a mystery mm -hmm. why we call it user supplied data, but that's actually the way it's put into our records um, as compared to you know our staff provided records. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and so it's, it's, it's useful for the public, it's useful for us. Um, yeah, the last bullet on here talks about that uh, uh, continuous recorder and getting constant data. Uh, in most cases, if that was required, you'd already know it. Um, and uh, we do have some of those around. Uh, often it's related to something else where we need data just constantly so we can turn things on and turn things off. But uh, probably in, you know, 99% of cases, that's, we don't need anything to that level. All right. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Well, I think that brings us up to um, a, another important part of this discussion, and that is a legal side of the discussion. And I want to pause for a minute and just remind us all that this rulemaking is a very formal process. And, and it's a legally described process that includes things like stakeholder meetings that we're doing tonight. 
And to help us navigate through that, we use the, the expert advice from our attorneys at the Attorney General's office. And we have two of our attorneys with us tonight also. And one is Andy Masevich and the other is Emily Halverson. And I'm gonna ask Emily a couple of times, uh, including right now to help us a little bit more understand the legal side of this process. So we're gonna zoom back out from all the technical information that Jason and Rob gave you, zoom out and talk about uh, the process from a legal standpoint. And Emily, if you could come on and say something about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, and, Kevin. And um, feel free to say more about yourself too. I just gave you a brief introduction. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. Um, again, I'm Emily Halverson. I'm uh, an assistant attorney general uh, with the attorney general's office, and I um, am helping support these rules. Um, so, as Kevin said, this is the this is the legal process, and um, it really stems from the uh, state engineer's authority to make rules. And when those rules pertain to the administration, distribution, and regulation of water, the rulemaking process is through the water court. And so there's some um, a lot of similarities with the um, traditional water right uh, court cases, um, but there's also some differences as well that I'll, that I'll, I'll highlight. Um, so similar to a water court case, um, you know, a, a filing for a water right or a change of water right, um, we will file the final rules with the Division 7 Water Court. Um, so that's going to be published in the resume and then also published in local newspapers as well. Um, similar to filing statements of opposition, um, people can file protests to the rules um, at the end, and those would be due at the end of the second month after filing, so a, a similar timeline as well. Um, the judge will set a case management order. Um, we will work to resolve all the protests. If a hearing's needed, that will get scheduled and held. Um, and then once all the protests are resolved, the judge will either approve the rules or remand for changes. And so this is a, a key difference in rulemaking compared to a normal water rights case is the purview of the court is more limited in a rulemaking. Um, and uh, the rules cannot be modified once we file them, um, unless, again, it's remanded and we start all over. So um, I just wanted to highlight that because it, it is a key difference. And also, um, it, it just highlights the importance of these stakeholder meetings and why we, um, and Kevin can speak more to this, but, but why we really um, value everyone's input up front um, so if we do have to make changes, we would prefer to do that before we file as opposed to filing and then having to start the process all over again. Great. Thank you so much for that, Emily. And yes, she said I might want to give additional emphasis to that, but you know, stakeholder serves, stakeholder process serves two purposes. And one is to make sure we get your input because you all know things that we don't know. And um, I know that in our past stakeholder process, we went out into a certain river basin and we learned that certain diversions are done a certain way. I think even our division engineer in that basin did not realize that was the case in, in uh, many of those diversions. So we need to learn from you. And then also, as Emily said, we want these rules just as close and, and actually to represent exactly what needs to be done so that they can successfully go through the water court. Uh, Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason in one minute to review the actual rules document. And it's a long document. He's not going to go through it word for word or line by line, but he's gonna hit on some highlights. Jason, I'll give you the screen in just a minute, but, but he's gonna go through it scroll through this long document. I wanted to give you the 30,000 foot orientation of what that document looks like and the components of it. And really it's it's a section on just introduction and authority and scope, um, what our existing authority is, exceptions to the rules, and then definitions. So that's some lead up information, but then what's really substantive about the rules is you know, where, where they're required and what the requirements of the measurement devices are some of the functional standards as far as accuracy and, and what type of device is needed for what type of diversion. And then approval standards, 
the things that Rob Genualdi and his team are going to be looking at to give approval that a measuring device is proper. And then more about data recording and submission in the rules. And Rob gave us some pretty good information on that, but Jason will orient us to where those show up in the rules. And then there's more information on compliance and, and potential variances and appeals of a decision. And lastly, a little bit of a phase-in schedule that helps us understand that once these rules are final in the court, what time do you have to actually be becoming compliance? And Jason, I'm gonna, if you're ready, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you so you can put the rules up and scroll through a little better. You might have to specifically give me screen sharing permission because it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, um, I bet I can. Oh boy, um, we we may have to do an unwieldy. Hold on. Uh, there you go. Try it now. Oh, that worked. Hopefully, I'm going to share the right thing. Can everybody see the beginning of the rules? And is it readable? Do I need to blow it up at all? Looks good. Okay. Unfortunately, I was planning on reading this as a bedtime story for you all so you could sleep well tonight, but uh, I don't think I should spend that much time going through all these rules. <laughs> so for reading them that detail, we're gonna go through them all, but... Um, so as Kevin mentioned, there's, you know, it's broken into sections. And so and this is a very specifically laid out process. And so rules have a format to them and, you know, title authority um, is what, you know, Emily talked about. I don't know if you want to say something else about our authority for implementing these rules or. Um just real quick, um, you know, we were required to list out the authority in in the rules. And um, as I mentioned, the state engineer has um, the authority to not only make rules, but also make these specific measurement rules. And so that's just what this paragraph details. Um, it provides the uh, statutory citations and then a brief description of what's in those uh, statutes as well. Thank you, Emily. And then we move into scope and purpose of the rules. Um, so <clears throat> as we've talked about, the purpose of these rules is to help measure um, structures. So we're defining what these rules apply to. And the important part about this scope section, I think, is there's this term at the end that says, they apply to all surface water diversions, groundwater diversions, storage, release, delivery, surface water, um, as defined in this section of statute, and then with the following exceptions. So during the division six process, um, this we've developed these exceptions because there are things that, that maybe don't need to be required to have a measuring device. And so we'll just go through these specific exceptions in the rules now. So the first one is permitted or unregistered wells that operate pursuant to the provisions of section 3792.602.1. So these are exempt wells, 15 gallon a minute household use only, domestic use wells. Um, some of those well permits themselves has require, have requirements for measurement, but we didn't feel that this was a, a necessary uh, to be in the to, to be required in the rules. Um, the second exception is ponds used for the limited purposes of livestock watering, wildlife watering, fire protection, or any combination thereof that do not intercept groundwater and are not filled by a diversion from a natural stream. So 
similarly here, there's a lot of uh, small ponds out there, limited in use, uh, livestock ponds. We included wildlife watering because many of those ponds that are have a livestock use or a fire protection use also include wildlife watering as an an ancillary use. So, um, and as long as they don't intercept groundwater and are not filled from a natural stream, they're not required to be have the storage reservoir requirements that we'll talk about later do not apply to them. Head stabilization ponds that are part of the conveyance and application of water of water right and do not or of water and do not divert water independently of the diversion under the water right and do not store water for more than 72 hours. So if you have a head stabilization pond that you put water in for irrigation and you use it to either have a deep enough place to pump from and you're cycling that water every three days or every 72 hours, then those uh, the rules do not apply to those ponds either. So surface water diversions and springs that are diverted at less than 15 gallons per minute used for the limited purposes of domestic use in no more than three single family dwellings, fire protection, watering of domestic animals, and the irrigation of not over one acre of home gardens and lawns, livestock watering on farms and ranches, wildlife watering or any combination thereof. And so those provisions probably sound, they sound familiar if you know our exempt wells and what they're permitted for. That is a lot of language from those exempt well statutes. And it, it includes that addition of wildlife watering because a lot of these springs that are out there also have that use, but exempting uh, these small diversions that are for pretty much for household use and domestic use. Erosion control dams and then diversion structures, the last one that are declared to be an inactive diversion structure in accordance with rule nine. So we'll go through rule nine, but there's a process for defining your structure as a inactive structure. Um, with the division. So the purpose, we've already went over that. We want to establish reliable standards to assist the division engineer in the administration of water. And Jason, sorry for interrupting. Uh, yes. I just saw a chat from Jeff Titus asking about decreed exempt wells. Jeff, I think you're asking in the context of exceptions, right? Yeah, are they are they um, accepted from this, or, or are they going to be um, required to uh, put in measuring devices? Jason, if you can you scroll back up to, I believe if they have a permit, they would be fall under this exception. Is that correct? Yeah, but there's some people who have that, that have exempt domestic wells under that um, statute, but they also have them decreed. Yeah, and Jeff, I'll, I'll just mention that we do know that same 602 statute does allow someone to get a water right for their exempt well, but it, it remains a uh, well permitted according to 3792.602. So it, it should be covered under 3.1.1, if that's right. Okay. I think we can scroll through. I mean, the purpose has, we've kind of covered that in the presentation. Definitions, we're not going to go through all of these because um, there's quite a few of them, but like I mentioned in my previous part of the presentation, there's a definition for alternative measurement methods for measurement methods and measuring devices that I've already explained. Um, and then definitions of many other things like head gates. And then the one definition that maybe we'll mention just briefly is qualified testers. So this is uh, defining the, the person that would be qualified to verify a structure's accuracy. So when we get to the accuracy standards, 
there's a standard for that's different based upon flow rates, but um, it would either need to be verified by a qualified tester or the division engineer's office. So rule five is, is short, but it's important. It's the headgate requirements. And as I mentioned previously, um, it includes this provision. So all diversions of surface water within the scope of the rule shall have a headgate. If necessary to control the rate of diversion, headgates must allow the commissioner or owner at the direction of the water commissioner to accurately adjust the diversion of water with a reasonable effort. So that would not be shoveling it in or using a backhoe or anything like that within a reasonable amount, reasonable amount of time and to secure the diversion structure at the adjusted condition to prevent any unauthorized diversion and adjustment. So typically the way I hear this mentioned is head gates need to be lockable and controllable. And they need to be lockable because, um, you know, typically our commissioners operate on the, on the, they trust a person until if they, if they adjust a head gate and come back later and find that somebody has adjusted it and taken more water than they were allowed under the call, then they might adjust it back to that level and lock it. Um, so they do need to be lockable. Um, but fairly short and sweet, not long, not you know difficult, but, and then this reasonable amount of time is where we, that's the statement that covers the, it needs to be close to the measuring device because a reasonable amount of time is not walking two miles downstream to look at the device and come back to the head gate. So rule six um, is important, the measuring methods and recording requirements. Um, so this is where, with the exceptions listed previously, other than the exceptions listed previously, all diversion structures shall either be equipped with a measuring device or an alternative measurement method that meets the requirement of rule 6.1. Um, and or be declared an inactive diversion structure as described in rule nine, which like I said, we would talk about here shortly. So please feel free to, to raise your hand like, like uh, Jeff did if you have any questions as we go through these, because you know that's what we're going through them for is to take questions and comments so that we can um, get these right before we file them with the Secretary of State. So the measurement method functional standard. So for this is where the accuracy standards um, are. And for the diversion structures or other structures that have a proposed flow rates under 6.1.2 greater than one CFS, a measuring device or alternative measurement method shall be designed to accurately measure flows to within plus or minus 5% throughout the full range of anticipated flows. So that's for anything one CFS and over that 5% um, accuracy standard applies. 6.1.3 is for diversion structures between 0.25 CFS and 1 CFS. They must measure within plus or minus 0 0.05 CFS. So we shifted from a percentage standard to an actual standard of flow. And then 6.1.4, flow rates less than a quarter CFS, the measuring device or alternative measurement method shall be capable of meeting an accuracy standard approved by the division engineer. And that's partly because um, these are, you know, these as very small flows might require a specialized device if, if necessary to measure flows below a quarter CFS. Are there any questions about those accuracy standards or functional standards? So a measuring device uh, must be within close uh, located within reasonable proximity of the diversion structure as determined by the water commissioner to enable them to observe the effect of headgate adjustments. So that ties back to that headgate requirement for a reasonable time to adjust. 
And then we talked and had those funny pictures of flumes that were obviously not properly installed. Measuring device or alternative measurement method shall be properly installed and if applicable, calibrated to engineering specifications. So it needs to be, for instance, probably needs to be level, needs to beat the, meet the dimensions that it was designed to. So partial flumes have specific dimensions, needs to meet those to be considered um, properly installed. Must be maintained in 617 by the user in a condition that provides accurate measurement throughout the full range of anticipated full range of flows or volume of water diverted stored in a reservoir. So this is where flumes that tend to silt in or moss up or grow a lot of, of vegetation below need to be cleaned so that they continually measure properly. And then uh, 618 just requires uh, you to provide a proper rating table. So if it's a standard partial flume, we probably, we have those rating tables. But if it's a ramp flume or some other kind of weir that's specialized, we need the rating table for that device before we consider it to be acceptable. So moving into reservoir requirements. So we've split the reservoir requirements into off-stream and on-stream. So 619 is for off-stream reservoirs and off-stream reservoirs will be required to have two of the following things. So can have a measuring device or alternative measurement method at the point of diversion. So it's a reservoir that does not sit on the natural stream that takes a ditch or a pipeline or something, takes water from the stream to the reservoir. That's what we mean by off stream. And so there has, has to be two of the following. One can be measuring the actual diversion uh, into that structure that takes water to the off stream reservoir. Second is um, some kind of device or measurement method to measure the volume of water in storage. So typically that would be a staff gauge, a transducer, and a proper stage uh, volume table for the reservoir. And then the third one is a measurement method or dev device to measure the releases. So the reason we need two of those three is because two of those three is necessary for us to do the calculations to calculate evaporation and do the administrative tasks required. Because if we know the inflow, we know the volume change, then we can figure out the release. If we know the release and the volume change, we can figure out the inflow. If we know the inflow and the release, um, then we can calculate the change in storage. For simple off-stream reservoirs, that's the case. For large reservoirs that we'll talk about on-stream, that's not quite the case because there could be lots of other inflows that you can't measure. So on-stream reservoirs, require, and so these uh, three things. So installation of an outlet or other structure capable of releasing all out of priority inflows. And this is because if you have a reservoir on the natural stream that we're administering, we need to be able to release that water to satisfy um, water rights, not necessarily storage even, but the inflow coming in during a senior call below the reservoir, we have to have a way to release the inflow to that senior water right. A measuring device or method used to measure the volume of water in storage, stage capacity table, and the staff gauge or transducer or something to measure the level. And then a measurement method or device to measure the releases from storage. Um, so there again, if we have the releases and the volume, then we can calculate the other things necessary. And that basically says right here what we what I just mentioned that this allows the division engineer to determine or calculate evaporation inflows and outflows. So I've did a lot of talking. That's all of the functional standards through reservoirs. Um, are there any questions or comments?
Okay. Moving on then. So recording devices, um, and we won't talk too much about these because like Rob said, if you have one on your structure now, then there's probably a reason. If you don't have one and we haven't asked for one, then these measurement rules aren't going to change that. We're not going to be requiring a continuous recording device through the rules. But you know, if it became necessary, either because uh, there's a change of water right, augmentation plan that requires more continuous monitoring, then this is the functional standard that uh, we would require for those recording devices. Um, and we've had you know, a question on at no greater than 15 minute intervals. And that's pretty much the standard for continuous recorders is that they record at 15 minute intervals. You can actually dial it down to five or less, but so that's kind of from actually just practically what most of those recording devices record at. Um, must, re you know, must include a means to verify on site that the recording device is properly calibrated. So it can't be just contained and no way to see what it's reading. But I think that's probably for this portion, unless somebody has a question about recording devices, since um, this is more special cases. So temporary measuring method 6.3. I mentioned this briefly under when we talked about float measurements. Um, and so in the instance where an accepted measuring device or alternative measurement method is incapable of accurately, accurately measuring flows, you may allow a division engineer may allow another temporary measurement method until the measuring device or alternative method is repaired, replaced, or restored. So this is where you would work with the commissioner and the D division engineer to determine what that temporary measurement method is going to be. If it's going to be a short time and it's maybe in a not critical area, it could be a float measurement. So a uh, measurement method verification. And this is the verification of those accuracy standards that we talked about in 6.1. Um, so the first one here, I think is probably the most important. If a measuring device, and remember device is a physical structure, a partial fl a flume or a weir, is properly installed and maintained and has a standard rating table, an adjusted standard rating table or custom rating table accepted by the division engineer or a stage capacity table as applicable, the division engineer shall presume that the measuring device is accurate and no verification will be required. So that means that if your device is installed properly and maintained properly and has a rating table, then the water commissioner can, we can deem that as acceptable. We don't have to go out and measure it to verify its accuracy. Because those devices, if they're built to standards and they're installed properly and work properly, are going to be as accurate as the measurement we do. If they're not installed properly, then that's not the case. But so if that's not the case. I mean, um, Jason, I'm sorry for sure. interrupting. And we're going to back up a little bit because uh, Pete Nylander, you had a question um, probably going back to reservoirs on how oxbow ponds are handled. And uh, Jason, you're welcome to take a crack at that or, or I can. But I'll, I'll leave it to you at first. Uh, maybe oxbow ponds that are in uh, in stream? Well, or and Pete, are they disconnected? Yeah, if, Pete, if you can come on, but I'm under, I took your question to be an oxbow pond that has been disconnected from the live stream and, and maybe just exists as a, a pond that exposes groundwater. Pete, would that be a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. It's like there's a lot of ponds along riparian areas that at one point may have been connected to the river, but over time have meandered away and aren't connected anymore and just pick up groundwater. Sure. I mean, I'll let Kevin uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that if those are natural oxbow ponds that were disconnected by some natural process, that those are not, those are, those are exempted under these rules. Those are not a need to have any measuring device. I, I would agree there was no excavation, no human caused activity to expose the groundwater to a natural pond. And what about the cases where, you know, it was an oxbow pond, but maybe a guy 40, 50 years ago modified it, or, you know, I'm just curious how you would address that, the history of some pond when who knows what someone did something to it a while back. Yeah, um, maybe this is not as helpful as it could be, Pete. I, I think that's a good question, but we're probably getting into a case by case determination. I, I suppose if it started out as an oxbow pond with a, a quarter acre of surface area exposed and then somebody developed it for some purpose, making it a one acre pond, then, then we probably do have something created by humans that is effectively a diversion. So um, I don't wanna make that an absolute until we could see get the facts on a case by case basis. And, Jason if, or Rob, if you have any additional thoughts on that, please jump in. No, I think that sounds like a good answer because it seems like it would be a case by case basis depending on the scope of the changes that were made, whether there's a water right there, whether they've lined the oxbow. I mean, there's a lot of different things that could occur. Yeah. Is that helpful, Pete? I guess he'd let us know if we didn't quite address it. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Anybody else have any questions up to this point? Maybe I'm going through this too fast. Okay, so we left off at the devices being properly installed, considered that they don't need verification. So the next part, 6.4.2, is that say there's a structure, I mean, this is intended to handle the situation where there's a measuring device that has been considered to be accurate because it was properly installed originally, but maybe the commissioner goes out and after a very hard winter, the thing is settled or changed and it's not, doesn't look like it's installed properly anymore. The division engineer may at any time require that a measuring device or alternative measurement method be rated or verified that it's operating properly. And such verification shall be conduct conducted by a qualified tester. And I mentioned this briefly, but you may not have caught it earlier when we talked about alternative measurement methods. 6.4.3, if you're using an alternative measurement method, not a device, so a rated section or some other method, um, that must be verified every four years, beginning on the date that the alternative measurement method is approved. And such rating or verification, again, shall be conducted by a qualified tester. So then 6.4.4 relates to the measuring equipment used to do the verification. And those are current meters, which I showed, we showed a picture of, and acoustic velocity meters are two of the common ones. Um, any of those kinds of meters used by qualified testers to certify the accuracy of measuring devices and alternative methods must be calibrated every two years to be accurate within plus or minus 2%. So if you're submitting a, a verification from a qualified tester, then it'd probably be wise to just provide that calibration information at that time. Um, and the, a report of the verification testing shall be provided to the division engineer on a form developed by the state engineer. So the next section, rule seven, is all about how the division engineer's office uh, is going to confirm approval or non-approval of measuring devices. So uh, in 7.1, 
to confirm the approval of the use of a pre-existing measurement method that was installed prior to the effective date of the rules, the water user should contact the commissioner or division engineer. The water commissioner or division engineer will confirm with notice in writing, including via email, that the pre-existing measurement method is approved or denied. And so one of the comments we heard at the last stakeholder meeting was, well, do I have to do I have to do this for my structures or all of them, or is this going to happen automatically? And so this is in here so that in order to comply with the timelines we have below, I imagine what the way this will be implemented is that our, our staff commissioners at the structures they go to, they know they have a good measuring device. They'll be able to confirm that that your measuring device is approved, maybe even before you contact them. But there is some requirement in here because if we get down the road close to the end of that, and maybe that this is something that was kind of slipped through the cracks, then you need to contact the commissioner and division engineer's office and say, hey, I need you to come uh, verify my measuring device or method, whether it's acceptable or not. <clears throat> And then that's for a pre-existing measurement method. 7.2 relates to new measuring methods um, and what you need to provide to the division engineer's office to seek approval for a new measurement method. Um, so you shall provide notice to the division engineer or division engineer's delegate, which could be the water commissioner, that include the following person's name, diversion structure, decree, case number, if applicable, legal description. So you're defining where am I putting this device and then telling us what kind of device it is and the rating table for that measuring device, if non-standard. And like I said, if it's a nine inch par shelf loom, we have the rating tables for those. We don't need uh, you to provide that. But if it's a ramp loom that was designed with a program like wind flume, then we would need a rating table and a stat stage capacity table in the case of a reservoir. Um, to obtain approval of the measuring device, the water user must provide evidence that the measuring device is properly rated and properly installed as described in rule 6.1. So that could be um, that 6.1 is the accuracy standards that could be done by a qualified tester. The commissioner or hydrographer might be out there and they might be able to confirm that as well. But to obtain approval of an alternative measurement method, so not a device, user must provide the basis for the use of an alternative measurement method. So why is it necessary here? So in the case of the East Canal that I showed a picture of earlier, because the grades were so flat, that's a very high established canal, carries over 500 CFS. Um, you know, provide those reasons why you want to use a rated section in that instance. So that covers the approval um, standards in the rules. Are there any questions for us on how that will be? implemented. We may not have all the specifics right now, but. Uh, Jason, if I could interrupt, and then Rob, if you're available, we have a question in the chat about whether DWR will be developing a standard form for water users to submit to obtain approval. And Rob, you may have shared some information with us about that in the past, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we have a uh, we we do have a standard form that kind of evaluates uh, at least partial flumes. Is that the form you're referring to, Kevin? Yeah, right. Yeah, and we can you know uh, in the past we've used it's been used by the water commissioners to go out to uh, you know uh, uh, measuring structures and flumes in particular to to uh, and just give some guidance on what they should be looking for and checkbox to say yep yep it meets these. Uh, this, this criteria, and you know, we can make that available to people to see what see what they're up against uh, before we even get out there. So, well, and I think um, if I understand the question, maybe the question is whether we will have a form that you can just fill out to request 
that evaluation of approval. And I believe that we we can come up with a form um, either online or or otherwise that uh, you could fill out to, to request that. Or you could request it by email or other uh, communication with the water commissioner or division engineer's office. Yeah, Jason, that's what I was getting at. So I think that'd be does helpful. That, does that answer? So it'd yeah. be helpful to have a form. Yeah, I think that'd be very helpful. Okay. Thanks. That's good. That's good input. Um, any other questions on that approval process? So rule eight is regarding data recording and submission. So it does say that the division engineer has the authority to require the water users to record and report at reasonable times the data for diversions by any diversion structure. Um, you know, typically we'll ask, at least in my you know experience, if if the water user is willing to provide us some additional data, I think for the most part, our our commissioners and Rob, please jump on and correct me if I'm wrong. You know, make it at some frequency to most of the structures that would be needing administration or these uh, measurement rules would apply to. But this is the way you know users can provide us data to give us more. Uh, detailed, frequent information on how much is being diverted. But I'm not aware of, you know, with what frequency we've required users, but we could do. A couple of times already, and that is uh, if you have a structure that um, spend a bunch of money to put a device on because you haven't used it in a long time, then you can apply to have that structure be considered an inactive diversion structure to be excluded from these rules. Files an affidavit on a form prescribed by the state engineer. Uh, water users use the diversion structure for any diversion or water application purpose. So once that is filed with the division engineer, then you won't get any notices that a measurement device is needed or approved or denied. But until, if you wanna change that status, the water user will need to um, file written notification to the division engineer prior to reactivating it. Um, so a diversion structure listed as ina inactive under rule nine shall not be used until notification is given. And the measuring device or method are determined to be in compliance with the rules. So then we have um, rules on what we deal with non-compliance. Um, and, you know, it can range from us to, um, sending an order, um, but we won't, we, I don't know that we need to go into detail on these um, prior to filing any court action, the division engineer shall notify the owner <clears throat> of the violation in writing. So that's where we would send an order by certified mail. There are ways to, there's a rule in here about getting a variance. So if you feel like there's some specific situations that require a variance from these rules, and I think this is something we were talking about at one of our meetings regarding some meters on pipes, on large turbines, uh, Animus La Plata project, potentially, um, then you can file for a variance for your specific case. And you know processes to appeal the legal language on severability. The next um, ones that might be uh, good to discuss here are these phase-in rules or phase-in timelines. 
So in order to allow water users the time to come into compliance with these rules, there's these timelines and 17.1.1, and they're based upon the structure capacity. So capacity or water right greater than five CFS, the deadline is 12 months from the effective date of the rules or capacities or water rights greater than equal to two CFS and less than five, 18 months. Diversion structures with capacity less than two, the deadline's two years or 24 months after the effective date of the rules. So giving structures that have you know, a bigger impact on the stream and on administration, less time than those that are smaller and may have less of an impact. And reservoirs are the same for reservoirs with a capacity greater than equal to five acre feet. It's 12 months for less than five acre feet, 24 months. And then there is 17.3 is if there's good cause upon good, a showing of good cause by the water users, the division engineer may extend the compliance deadlines of rule 17.1 for one or more periods of time, not exceeding one year. And then the last part is effective date, which we don't know yet. So what questions do you have on the portions that I've just went through that we haven't had any questions on yet? Yeah, I, I'll just open it up, Jason, in addition to that. Thank you. <laughs> questions specific to what Jason talked about, but questions about everything we talked about tonight, maybe something we didn't cover. What um, what are you all wondering about? Um, I'm going to give you some information on our next steps, but we'd just like to open it up first. You can chat or just unmute yourself. Either one is fine. Hi, my Hi. name is Wynn Wright. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to say <clears throat> on behalf of the water commissioners of division seven, <clears throat> they've done an excellent job of sharing the pain. Probably goes back a long way past Chuck Lyle. <clears throat> and uh, I don't see any provisions in here for sharing the pain. If, if they're strictly enforcing all these head gates, there's gonna be uh, friction between water users. Can, can you say a little bit more about that? Are you talking about that the, the fact that with measuring devices, some of that administration that De Jason talked about in his schematics is going to be imposed and then uh, then there's going to be friction between the water users just because of curtailing water rights? Exactly. If it's strictly administered rather than sharing the pain as it's been done here in the Southwest for, for many years, then it could create more friction between land uh, neighbors. Can, can you tell me specifically where you are and on the river and maybe Rob or one of your water commissioners? I'm in Durango and I've, I've worked with uh, Jeff Titus and the, the rule in the Animus River. The reason why there hasn't been a call because you share the pain. Well, I don't, do you mind if, I mean, I think Rob could answer this question, but I don't think that requiring measuring devices means that Rob's commissioners are gonna change the administration, you know, regime on the river. If if you're all sharing water right now and, and able to take, you take it one day and the guy downstream takes it the next day to prevent the call, Rob, are you? Yeah, when I I, th I think the point of you know is that uh, we we want to be able to get this information whether there's a call or not, be able to get information on diversions and how much is being used and that sort of thing, you know, um, minus a call, you know, if people are getting along or they're sharing, um, administration under the priority system won't happen until that call is made, and so hopefully people still you know, in, in most cases work together. Um, and and, uh, uh, and regardless of, you know, now that they're, 
may be required to put in a flume uh, or, or, you know, and, and whatnot, uh, uh, hopefully won't, won't change that. Um, so, so anyways, yeah, that, that coordination and that uh, cooperation between folks, hopefully will continue wherever it can. Pro provide that flexibility in the language. I did not see that. Oh. Yeah, I don't think that it's specifically addressed because I think this just uh, has to do with just just putting in the ability to measure and the ability to control inflows and not and not uh, doesn't really get into you know how things are administered or 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 um, or how you know or, or the priority system at all. Just 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 addressing you know what kind of flumes and and what criteria is is needed to in a time frame for for putting in measuring devices. Well, I, I see legal language in there that could implicate the water commissioners for disobeying the rules. Maybe, so I, maybe I can ahead. take one more try at that, uh, Red, if you don't mind. It's good to distinguish the utility of measuring devices and what they do for water administration from water administration itself. So when Jason was showing us that schematic about how a typical call could work, he did that to show the value of a measuring device if the water commissioner is doing that water administration. But if there's a practice okay. on the river, uh, you're using the word term sharing the pain. If you know we can call it a subordination or a de decision to not call, uh, people on stream systems around the state do that from time to time when they want to coordinate to keep more water in the river. And so nobody's going to require that someone place a call. And it sounds like that's the cooperative agreement you've got. And we distinguish that from a set of rules that gives us the structure for measuring devices. Remove the liability for the water commissioners to make their decisions. Thank you very much. You bet, thank you for that comment. Um, I had another question, and this is regards to um, in-stream flow rights. Is there any, does this apply to in-stream flow rights as well? And measurement of, of those? Jason, did you want to take that sure. scroll up to the top? You, you may want to scroll up to the top of the rules too. Is there a... <clears throat> Um, and I, I'm just thinking maybe so, in that title, there you go. Yep. In the down here? Um, higher up. Um, this title? Yeah. So I, we're I, I talking think... about, sorry, just to, to give you the start, we're talking about surface water and groundwater diversions, and diversions being the key word. Okay, thanks for that. that um, yeah, so diversions is the it being the key word, these measurement rules don't require, um, they're not listed specifically in the exemptions, but because during administration of a call by a senior water right, a, a uh, in-stream flow right is not diverting anything from the stream, it's not consuming any water, there's nothing for the, diver for the water commissioner to do to administer that in-stream flow that would provide any more water to the senior calling water right. And so they wouldn't necessarily have to have a measuring device to accomplish administration on the stream. If an in-stream flow right calls, our practice has been to require that they have a gauge to make that call so that we can evaluate whether the water right for the in-stream flow is actually short of the legal amount that it's decreed for. Um, and if there isn't a gauge that can confirm that, then we haven't uh, honored those in-stream flow calls in places where there is not a measuring, I guess you'd call it an alternative measurement method for the in-stream flow. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just wondering the policy. Those are good questions, both of them. Are there other questions?
If not, and keep thinking, free to chat at any time, but Jason, if you don't mind uh, yeah. giving me the screen back and I'm just gonna put two more slides up and, and then we'll wrap up. But. I do have a question. Uh, this is Chuck Ream over in Pagosa. I have a question about Trans Mountain. Does any of this have, uh, apply to historically uh, in use Trans Mountain diversions? And Chuck, I'll ask you to make sure I understand. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the San Juan Water Conservancy District Board. Um, so, and I'm just, we're, we're curious because we're in some lawsuits with Trans Mountain. And I don't know if the rules that we're just going through here are applying to the Trans Mountain that goes from the west side to the east side and goes back over into the Rio Grande or into the Chama River. Yeah, and and so I guess we would treat the division boundary as controlling, I mean, the water division boundary for Division 7, and these rules apply within Division 7. So if that Trans Mountain diversion we're talking about has a diversion, say, into storage, into a bucket in Division 7, then the measurement would apply there. That's where the diversion is. If it's uh, if water is going through a tunnel or through a ditch into the other the other division, and they don't have these rules, then these specific rules would not apply. However, uh, I know that for important Trans Mountain diversions, that that receiving division is likely going to want strict measurement as well. Um, they watch those Trans Mountain diversions pretty closely. How close did I come to answering your question? <clears throat> um, 78%. All right. <laughs> Can we get the other 22 or was that, <laughs> that basically doing No, I, I, I think the rest of it comes with the details around a specific uh, water right and when it went in and where are they measuring or if they're measuring. And I didn't know if this was going to start impacting some of our lawsuits. Yeah. We got like six lawsuits that we're paying for. So it's it's that it's that's the source of my question. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Yep. That's good. I appreciate it. Sure. What else do we have out there? Okay. Well, I won't cut you off, but I will bring up this one more screen just to close it out a little bit uh, again allowing for additional questions but our next steps we want to gather email addresses from all of you tonight and, and tell your friends uh tell your neighbors we want email addresses so we can give you notifications and distribute rules sherry titus put her email address in a chat but i'm going to put it up i'm going to show it on the screen in a minute after we've gotten a, a good accounting for all of the input from our stakeholder meetings as a as a state group, DWR and the Attorney General's Office, we'll see where we need to make changes. We'll send those out to you in a red line form that shows the changes that we, we made if we make changes. And then we want to get feedback from you all and solicit comments and what we'll start that off is you'll get an email from Jason or me or Bob or some combination of us telling you that we, we've got a new set of rules for you to look at or an updated set of rules. And we'll give you a Word document. You can make comments in a Word document, or you can just email comments to the Division of Water Resources, show you that, keep those email addresses in a minute. And we make create a, a Google comment form for people who like using that. that. That's a good way to gather data. And we'll make sure we give you a good way to send in information. And then we'll review all those comments again. And if there's further amendments to the rules, we'll do that. And that might be a, a little bit of an iterative process. Then we might, th then we would likely send those out to you again. We'll see whether there's a need for additional stakeholder meetings. Uh, either by Zoom or in person or both. And uh, 
so I hope that doesn't sound like endless iterations. It would probably just be one more cycle, but we really want to make sure that we give you a good chance to give thorough input and good feedback on what we did with that input. And then the way Emily described it, once we decide we have got a good set of rules that has addressed the concerns and, and serves its purpose, then we'll file those in water court in that process that Emily described. Is there any question about that that I just told you? And certainly um, you can pass that again in a minute, but I'm gonna give you a little time to look at these email addresses. And at the top is sherry.titus at state.co.us. And you can be your primary contact. And if you want to be put on the notification list, email her and she'll get you on it. Again, that notification list will be the way we, that we can communicate with you with updates and copies of any updated rules. And then my name, Jason's name, and Rob's name, um, and our email addresses. You can email us if, if you just have general questions or other comments. You're you've got some strong feelings about this or something. Feel free to give us a an email, and then there's our website address that you'll be able to just get a, a, a wealth of information on what we're doing in the history of how we've done this. Uh, Jason, Rob, Emily, do you have anything else that you'd like to say um, while we're waiting to see whether there's any more questions? Hey, Kevin, this is Steve yeah, Wilson, Steve. Northwestern. I'm Steve, just curious if you can put a little bit of a time frame or schedule on the next steps you on the previous slide. Hmm. Just a tough idea. Yeah. Uh, Good question, Steve, because I really didn't identify that. And I think that, you know, we've gotten a couple comments or questions tonight. And I would say that if anybody has any burning comment that they that they didn't share tonight, they could email it maybe in the next week. But what we'd really like to do is move on to that next iteration I talked about and just put together all of our feedback from the five stakeholder meetings. And I would say, you know, give us maybe two to four weeks to put together um, a new document, an edited document with any changes that we saw were necessary. And, and so that two to four week mark would be when I'll go to that second bullet and send a copy of the rules document asking for that feedback in forms of a Word document or email comments or using the link to the comment form. And, and from there, Steve, does that make sense, Steve, what I said there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. From there, you know, it'll depend on how many comments and the type of comments we get on that fourth big bullet where we say we'll review all comments and amend with the rules where appropriate and move on to that second iteration. Um, We'll just see what the extent of the comments are. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Anything else we can answer? Um, let's let's just go back to this. <laughs> really want to make sure you can jot down these email addresses. And if not, uh, we're just coincidentally coming up on the two hour mark. I might uh, say we can adjourn this and give the meeting back or give the evening back to you all. Um, last call. Any, any more questions? Anything from Jason, Rob, or Emily? I don't have anything else. Okay. Just thank you for all the time you put into this. Um, we appreciate it down here. Absolutely. Um, this is thank you. You bet. Um, thank you thank all. Thank you. Our pleasure.